Well, welcome everyone to the second uh, uh, book club meeting. I guess one unfortunate thing about having a book club with a book with an introduction is that we're always going to be uh, enumerated one off. So it's meeting number two to discuss chapter number one. Uh, we have two fabulous uh, guests uh, who are going to be discussing the chapter with us today. Um, Liz Loesch from William & Mary, and then George Siemens, who's at the University of Texas, Austin, and uh, the University of Texas, Arlington, um, and then uh, also at a university in Australia, which embarrassingly evades me at the moment, but uh, he'll, he'll tell us in a moment. Um, there are a whole bunch of you who are online with us now, um, and I would be delighted if you could take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, if you could just hop in to all panelists and all attendees and tell us uh, who you are and where you're from um, and what brings you to these interests. And uh, if you if you work in a capacity that's relevant, it would be great to get you know you. Um, I will try to keep monitoring the chat as we go along through the conversation. And we'll take your questions and take your responses and take your ideas um, as we're going along. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, and we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. So um, the way, as we did last week, I'm going to ask uh, George and Liz to introduce themselves is with their ed tech story. Um, so, so George, can you tell us who you are, um, what kinds of things you work on, what, what, Austra what Australian university you're affiliated with, um, and then what, what's, the, what's, what's your sort of encounter with ed tech that is kind of most salient to you right now or got you started on this pathway or um, you just want to introduce yourself with? Great. Thanks, Justin and uh, Liz. Uh, great to connect uh, here again. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm with the University of Texas Arlington, like you noted, Justin, and I co-direct a center in Australia, the Center for Change and Complexity and Learning um, at the University of South Australia. My ed tech story, I guess probably the one that really got me to where I am now, at least in terms of interest, was uh, Red River College, 1999-ish. And we were the first college system in Canada that went laptop. And by laptop, what that basically means is every student had to pay on a monthly basis about $4,000 over the cost of their degree to get a laptop. Because at that point, you, you know, you get... Uh, whatever you've got for, for storage space and the software and everything else loaded on it, it was about a $4,000 touch. And that was distributed to the students in the term of a monthly expense. Now, what was interesting was seeing how the use of this technology injected into an existing structure. So the classrooms were the same, nothing changed. Curriculum was the same, classroom was the same. But what had changed was the classrooms across the college had, in our department at least, had been completely redone over a summer. So the ethernet uh, connections, uh, oddly enough, actually uh, the uh, power to each seat, which was still is an anomaly in some universities. And uh, watching how that impacted the learning process was amazing. So the one side of the classroom, namely the students, started doing all kinds of fascinating things. They discovered you could download videos. And at that point, the college bandwidth was five megabits for the entire college. And so the first student in at 6.30 that got a nice video to download could completely impact the entire quality of the bandwidth for the rest of the college for at least a few hours. But, uh, you know, but seeing that happen, they, at that point, there were a lot of just ICQ, if you recall, for messaging systems and so on. So there's a lot of that going on, a lot of experimentation on the, on the one side of the classroom. On the other side of the classroom, there wasn't. And that was the teacher who, instead of using a traditional overhead projector, now had PowerPoints and so on. So I found that a fascinating illustration on how technology unevenly influenced those who have access to it. Now, since then, there's a range of reasons why that happened in terms of background, workload, expertise, and so on. But it, it was that moment, understanding how the same tool in an environment produced dramatically varying outcomes has, has still probably been the most uh, influential thing to think about in the ed tech space. That's great. How do, how do people with different institutional roles, given the same technology, um, uh, think about it, employ it, engage with it differently? What a great question to work with um, for a long period of time. Um, and Liz, can you introduce yourself as well? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, my ed tech story begins in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was a freshly minted um, 
undergraduate degree person from an Ivy League institution teaching at a delinquency prevention center and running a, a computer lab there. Um, and I, uh, there was something called the Public Electronic Network or PIN. It was a, a system that allowed digital deliberation um, for the city of Santa Monica. Uh, Howard Rheingold writes about it uh, in a couple of his books. And I had these students who were, you know, in, in, had, had had contact with the justice system and were in this sort of after school diversion program um, doing uh, kind of not quite informal formal learning, not quite formal learning, kind of the place in between. But they were, uh, you know, it was also a coercive space because it was, you know, they had to go there as part of their probation or parole. And I thought, I'm going to put these kids on pen. And this is going like, to give them the opportunity to um, communicate with their elected representatives and participate in local governance in ways that will make them feel like they're real citizens of the city rather than criminals. So I, initially it, it did not seem to be working because the students, uh, they lost their passwords. This was when George remembers these days, right? When you had these like really long unwieldy usernames and passwords that were sort of being generated by these, you know, uh, uh, places that were used to, to, to mainframe computing. And so the students, you know, just didn't like it. They just felt like it was busy work. And then suddenly one day, it seemed like overnight, all of the students were on the computers and they were all on pen. And they were actually trying to convince their siblings and cousins and friends to come to the after school center and suddenly like everyone was on pen and I was like this is the greatest thing this is so exciting they're you know they must be like having these wonderful cerebral political discussions and of course they were just using pen to talk to each other it was essentially like just sort of high-tech passing notes and at the time I was completely crushed by this right because I felt like my uh you know techno missionary ideals were somehow being betrayed by these students and yet you know, later I came to understand it was a kind of politics with a small p and that they were doing political action by connecting with each other mm -hmm. and that connected that connection can be a political act. Um, so then I've been involved in all kinds of crazy pedagogical experiments. Uh, I, uh, one of them is the selfie course, which I just put in the chat. And the one that I was involved with for the longest time was FemTechNet, which did a distributed open collaborative course that was a, a kind of response to MOOC madness. Um, you know, generally I've been in the, the, the skeptical camp rather than the charismatic camp to use uh, uh, Justin's uh, uh, terms. Um, and, you know, I've written a couple, a couple of books about online learning. Uh, and, you know, like Justin, I'm very interested in thinking about educational technologies broadly and realizing how things like Chairs that move are educational technologies, and windows that bring in light are educational technologies. So, well, and, it, and these days, windows that bring in clean air, um, mm -hmm. and uh, windows that bring in, uh, you know, the box fans that that recirculate air through rooms are education technologies that are certainly in the news right now. But let's stay in the past at least for a little while um, and talk about MOOCs. How how did Chapter One? read to you, Liz, you know, what, like, what did, what did you take, you know, assuming now that I'm the author and I've given it away and it's not really mine anymore, it's just words on a page, uh, you know, what, what do you read in that and how does it align or, or misalign with uh, um, your own research from the period? Um, and, and, and feel free to, you know, if, if, if so, some of what comes out of that as a summary, there may be some folks in, who, who are joining us who haven't had a chance to read the chapter yet, so you can, you can give us a bit of an overview too. Well, I mean, one of the things I appreciated about the chapter was the kind of uh, uh, the humility of it. Like the fact that when you're talking about the experiments that worked, I, I like the sort of paradigm of tinkering um, because I think I tend to be much more of a tinkerer than a kind of grand uh, wizard of transformation. Um, and I think that often uh, smaller incremental changes uh, 
that are more participatory uh, are more successful. I think also sometimes with educational transformation. So one thing is that sometimes you can have like a, an experiment that's wonderful for a short time, but it's just not built to last. And so, you know, you bring a bunch of people together. They, there's, there's kind of great good feeling online. It like doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't able to, to sustain itself. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of temporary autonomous zone that, you know, that eventually sort of disappears into ether. Um, I, I think the two, the, the two observations I had, I was thinking about the part about auto graders, which seems like a relatively minor part, just the, the kind of what does it mean to have a learning management system, automate assessment. And, uh, you know, I've taught in different kinds of online and hybrid environments a lot. And one of the things that I think that technology allows you to do is allows you to connect with students who maybe didn't get the best grades in the course, but they actually, because often the students who get the best grades, who when you assess them, they seem the most competent, they actually aren't necessarily the ones who learned the most. And they're not necessarily the ones for whom the course is the most meaningful. So I actually think email is a really important educational technology. And I think when it comes to assessment, I think the ways that an instructor can be touched by a student who's making connections between the course material and life, sometimes years after you've, had, you've spent that pedagogical time together, I think is a, is a piece that's really important when it comes to digital technology. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, when you talked about the data deluge and kind of the, the ways that, you know, there's, there are all these analytics that instructors have access to. And I think the thing that a lot of instructors find really depressing is that, again, the students that they thought were the students who were really the top and who, when they, you assess them using traditional means, they assess well, but you might find out that they're actually not watching any of the content or spending any time actually engaging with the material because they're people who are already proficient. Um, and I think that a lot of instructors are, are, are coming to terms with that data uh, and often not coming to terms with it, just being depressed about it. Yeah, it's a, you know, a, yeah, a fascinating phenomenon of people who were, you know, I mean, if you, if you have to pay a lot of money to take a course and you already know the material, you're unlikely to, you know, spend X thousand dollars of your graduate school tuition fees to take something you've already done. Um, but there's some fraction of people for whom, you know, taking, studying a course full of material that they already know is deeply satisfying. And in one way, that's like, what a neat kind of learner to discover. Um, what, you know, what, 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 what an interesting person that we wouldn't have thought about and wouldn't necessarily design for. Um, but those learners also can you know, loom large in powerful ways in, in our assessment of practices and so forth. Um, George, what's your reaction to, to Liz's framing or, uh, um, or what other things did you, did you find in or missing in the, the discussion of, of MOOCs from chapter one? Well, I think, uh, first of all, obviously, you, you've been involved in the MOOC conversation since it, it made the popular jump in, in the U.S. So it, I think you covered how it roughly went. And the for those of you that haven't had a chance to read the chapter yet, uh, essentially, Justin makes a point that learning at scale, the instructor component, is an interesting dynamic of the current ed tech space. And there's some different opportunities that exist. And then there's three distinct bets that are possible with MOOCs. One is that it's going to transform the just higher education in general. Uh, this is really the hypester crowd, if you will. Uh, the second was that it's going to increase access to higher education. And then the third was that it's going to provide a new foundation for research and interesting ways for us to understand what happens in the learning process and so on. And then essentially uh, following those, those three assertions, uh, he takes us through rough overview of the global level of ed tech. So specifically talking about the role that learning management systems played early on. So your Blackboard and now Canvas and so on. And then when computer scientists discovered learning online and the things that they cared about, which is where the auto graders conversation comes in. 
and then eventually moving into uh, what's now the online program manager work of organizations like 2U and others that will go in, help a university move an entire program online, take 40, 50 plus percent of the total tuition revenue, and uh, they'll have an online program. Uh, so, and then from there, eventually ends up addressing the issue of the K-12 space regarding summit learning and roughly the way that that uh, didn't make an impact uh, at the transformative scale that was initially promised. So that's just a little bit of the skeleton. I'm skipping a lot of important parts, but a couple of the things just as a reaction, Justin, that came out of it. One, this is a book written in the U.S. and that does overlook uh, a lot of the things happening in other parts of the world. I think if I was, if I look at the numbers and they're so hard to actually come by and trust, you know, because you'll have a group that'll put out, oh, these, this is what we got. You know, Holland IQ says there's X number of millions of learners in MOOCs in the world. And you'll talk to say Xu Tong X out of China and they'll say, you know, we've got 180 million learners on our platform and so on. Uh, you've, so I think that's the one thing I would say, a part of the story that is not necessarily fully fleshed out is the international component of MOOCs, which is significant. It's a US centric view of ed tech uh, transformation, which is understandable because much of the ed tech initiatives are US based. Um, the other aspect that I, I was, as I was reading through it, I was struck with MOOCs, and maybe it's because of sort of my particular background with the idea of MOOCs and the opportunity for people to connect and collaborate and learn and generate knowledge together less of the instructivist framework that we currently see. I, I still like them. I, I, I still like the fact that someone somewhere in the world, even though you do say, you know, as a bumper sticker, you know, MOOCs are for basically uh, people who already have one or two degrees, uh, was I think your, your uh, statement to summarize exactly the role that MOOCs play. I, I still think they have uh, potential for people to learn, to acquire, to understand things they might not have been able to access before. And I think in some ways, they're an indictment of the existing leadership of higher education. I mean, we've seen every sector of society digitize and transform at some level, maybe not transform the way that Sebastian Thrun said we were going to transform, but we've seen it have an impact. So I think that was the one thing that, that still struck me as I was going through. Did it give access the way we thought it would give access? Well, in theory, yes, but in reality, it was mainly people with degrees that took them. I'd like to see how that's changed post uh, COVID with a lot of uh, universities starting to use them at the undergraduate level for a sort of a textbook type of resource. Um, the other aspect is the transition to what's now the skilling and reskilling movement. And this is one of those things that you're like, well, on the one hand, it, it is, there's something there, but on the other hand, how much is it generated by people who are trying to sell a solution into that space? So, you, you know, you, you create your own, your own demand, so to speak. So I think that was another thing I was left with a little bit confused in terms of where might that go? Because in the age of, hundreds of examples of failed predictions to go out and say, hey, this is what I predict will happen next. Uh, it, it feels inauthentic the moment you say it because people have been so incredibly long, uh, wrong so often about the impact of uh, digital education. Uh, George, there, so there's a bunch of things, Liz and George, that you've both offered us to dig into more. Why, why don't we start with the international piece? Um, if, the, if, if, a, if a revised version of the chapter came out with, with a better perspective on the sort of global impact of MOOCs, what do you think would be in there? Like what kinds of things ought, ought, um, you know, should, should be considered that were missed? And George, we, well, from, we can start with you. Okay, from my end, so first of all, that's, that's a, uh, it's, it's a very soft, it's not even a critique of the chapter, so just to be clear. Oh, it's no, just me sorry. saying one, <laughs> One of the things that, that I was uh, looking for is, let's say what's gone on with FutureLearn. FutureLearn has a fairly different pedagogical model than what edX and Coursera have. And you'll see it in that a lot of the people who were involved in the development of FutureLearn have a background in learning sciences or in uh, teaching and learning online or something. If As you look opposed at the to the computer who, scientists who founded Coursera and edX and Udacity. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's the equivalent of, of uh, you know, say in 1998, uh, computer science, somebody lands on the U.S. Uh, soil and proclaims it for mother, you know, queen of England kind of thing. I mean, it's there, it's understood, it's a domain, it's established. And that's what digital learning was pre- Sebastian through Norvig and, uh, and eventually edX with Anand Agarwal and others. There was a space of literature, a space of practice that goes back 30 plus years. Now, uh, so I think that's probably the biggest thing that would, including say a future learn angle is the fact that, that 
this was a group of people ignorant of a domain discovering a domain that was already established. And so when you see it from that lens, especially with a, with a thing, a company like FutureLearn, you see that you can have a different product that emphasizes different approaches to teaching and learning, and that is much less instructivist. The other aspect, and, and China, because it's so difficult, like we, you know, if you follow the EdTech unicorns thing, you know, most of these companies are a, a, a you know, valued at a billion plus, I think, was it five or six of the top 10 are out of China. We don't know how authentic that is. We know a valuation is vaporware, uh, you know, the whole way through, even until they go public and so on. So there's some issues with that. But a group like China, which when I was on a panel, uh, just at the start of the COVID crisis with, uh, with the, from, uh, I guess it was uh, Xu Chang and a couple of other universities in, in Beijing and Shanghai. And they were talking about how quickly they had to basically move hundreds, thousands of courses online that included over 10 million uh, faculty, university profs in China. And they did this at a scale of a few weeks. And central to this was using this approach for, for PD development. By this approach, I mean the scale component. I have no idea what the cultural pedagogical roots of education in China are, uh, you know, obviously we know they're fairly instructivist. I'd love to know more about what they are. So I think that's one thing that including who's likely the largest MOOC provider right now in China, the Xutang X example would be interesting if it, if it's not to China, see. It's India. Um, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think India has, India has a number of players in the MOOC space that, or the MOOC-ish space that have monetized different components of, but they haven't formally launched onto the instruction at a distant scale, the way that China has emulated the edX Coursera model. Um, there's, well, I mean, one piece to look at is this thing called SWIAM, um, which is another sort of enormously large uh, MOOC provider. But yeah, you know, so when you, when you have countries with more than a billion people in them, um, you know, things are, things are different. The, uh, um, I, I only, I visited China to discuss MOOCs once. Um, and, uh, definitely, definitely the, the vast scale. I don't know. I was talking, somebody was giving a presentation on a project, which was a, which was a pilot study that they were doing of, uh, um, a teacher education program. And there were 300,000 people that were enrolled in the pilot study. Um, and I was like, you've got a pretty good sized pilot study going there. Um, and can then, I, can uh, I throw a question yeah. back to you, Justin? Uh, you know, we, as the author, post, uh, you, you talked last week when you and Audrey and Chris met, um, you know, how you were basically doing your revision of the, the uh, forward and stuff as COVID was, was unrolling. So what, if you were to look at it now, from what you've seen, how MOOCs have been used, especially by American universities, this, you know, three, four, 500% increase in registration, would you say something different about the role of MOOCs in classrooms as we've seen the adoption rate outside of what you framed in the chapter being people who already have a degree? What, what would you have written differently if you were to look at it now or anything? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, I mean, certainly there was a moment like on March 23rd when we're sending in, when I'm sending in the, the copy edits being like, is there anything I'm going to be horribly embarrassed by, you know, six months from now as the world changed? Um, so there are huge new registrations in some places in HarvardX and MITx and Coursera. Um, I think, you know, one challenge that I'm having with everything around COVID analysis is that there's not a lot of data about what's actually being done. Like, like the, it seems to me like the actual nature of that practice matters a lot. My intuition is that the number one category is people with additional leisure time studying stuff on their own. That the second category, and Liz is nodding and, and, uh, and um, suggest so that too, we'll let her answer this question as well. That the number two category is some kind of assignment from professors of being like, I'm still going to teach my class. I'm going to, you know, I'm still going to teach my Zoom class, but here's like a supplementary resource that you could check out. Um, the thing which, you know, and I am fully ready to be proven wrong on this, but I feel like the thing which has not happened is, hey, these like rinky dink Zoom classes that we all are having to make up, you know, in the midst of a pandemic with children running on our feet are pretty bad. Why don't we just send people to Coursera or edX or FutureLearn to take classes that cost, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to build. And I just don't see a surge of demand for that. I, you know, even though the demand is not that high, it's even less than what I thought it would be. Um, I, I thought many more people would say, look, 
you know, we know that there are, there are challenges for people who struggle with self-directed learning or aren't in the condition to do good self-directed learning. But boy, we've put a lot of money and effort into these and like, seems like now is the time to use them. And I'm really quite shocked at how little that has been, you know, and the only answer that I can come up with, which is like, you know, I have two data points on this. I saw, you know, heard a series of surveys from people at MIT and one survey of uh, a whole bunch of college students in Bangladesh um, that somebody at the World Bank did. Um, and like, half the college students they could survey in Bangladesh wanted live synchronous instruction. Um, and I just think about like Bangladesh can't be one of the world's leaders in internet connectivity. There has to be, or device ownership, like there has to be all kinds of challenges that those students are facing. Um, just like there are all kinds of challenges that, that American students and faculty face. But for all that, people still, like if they get to choose what kind of higher education they want, most of them want a human being to connect with even if that content is not as good as what might be offered in some other circumstance. Um, and that is kind of a, you know, a, seems like a fatal flaw of the whole enterprise of scaling up is that you can't scale up that sense of connection to a person that you know. I don't know, Liz, what, what would be your answer to George's question? Well, I mean, I think that the interesting thing about COVID and all the people teaching on Zoom right now, uh, and, you know, part of this is, you know, it's, I have been, uh, observing Zoom classes and sort of looking at what my peers are doing and also looking at what people I supervise are doing with Zoom. And I think it's actually, what is working is actually not going big, but going small. So for example, uh, I was using the breakout rooms for these design challenges and students could pick a design challenge that they would go into a group of like three or four people and they just have to talk about this challenge based on the reading um, that they would then have to come up with some solution for. And we'd sort of vote for what the challenges would be. And then students would choose the breakout room where they would be working on the challenges. So it was actually like this sense of the way that Zoom as a technology can actually create even more intimate spaces for learning and conversation that feel even more, uh, uh, in, in, even more dependent on interpersonal relationships, um, I think is important. And I think also because students have, have, have felt like that they've lost so much autonomy right now, that just being able to choose what breakout room you go into rather than have it randomly assigned by the software, which is what most instructors do, um, means a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's a and it's a you know it's a, and it's autonomy with sort of social consequences like you know MOOCs provide all kinds of autonomy for people to be able to choose whatever you know discussion form they want to enter or what order of videos they want to watch but it doesn't have but it has virtually no impact on the other people who are around you um, in the way that uh, that engaging in uh, you know in choosing a Zoom room will will impact the way that you connect and socialize with the other people around you. I also think that right. you're. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Liz. Oh, I was gonna, I was thinking about the rainbow loom beginning and, you know, all the DIY stuff that people are doing as they're teaching themselves to, you know, make sourdough bread or, you know, all these other things. Um, and, you know, that's really, to me, the thing that I've most observed on, um, on, you know, when I'm looking at how people are responding to COVID. And I hope later on we can talk about TikTok and learning because I, I have some thoughts. Anyway, George, take it away. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so I think what, one of the things that's fascinated me is MOOCs have been here now for, in their current form, for about eight years, as prominently represented by uh, American universities. And I don't know if I've ever seen an ed tech thing where we can spend eight years talking about what is it. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been trying to define what are MOOCs. Are MOOCs this? Are they that? They're not this. They're not that. I mean, it's, it's, I, I find it fascinating. I mean, why we're having so much difficulty really nailing down what MOOCs are and what role they play. Part of it might have been early on. Unfortunately, the, you know, the ed tech hypesters came out and told us they were going to be everything and change the world. And, and folks like Clay Shirky, uh, who, mm -hmm. you know, declared that, you know, universities have met their Napster moment. And I still think there should be public shaming of people who've made these ridiculous statements and this public shaming should occur. 
uh, at least until an appropriate period of penance has been achieved. <laughs> but you know, the the um, those kinds of statements come out, and and we're, we've been so wrong so often. And then right after that happened, then of course there was this corrective cycle. And faculty who had been under siege with this idea of MOOCs being this be all and end all suddenly MOOCs sort of fizzled by their transformative capability. And then it was faculty's turn to declare MOOCs dead. You know, MOOCs who continue to get hundreds of millions of dollars annually in funding and financing and adding hundreds of millions of students annually. And clearly they're not dead. Clearly they're playing a role somewhere. And I'm just fascinating why it's been so difficult for us to be able to say what are MOOCs and what role do they play. And that gets back to a quick point before I throw it back to you, Justin, is one of the things I like that you got on early in the chapter, or it may have been the previous chapter actually, where you started to make this argument or this discussion around, why haven't we seen this, cha uh, this change that we were promised with all things ed tech? And you know, it's, it's a real interesting interplay of how do systems of systems change? And you get into this you know, a little bit where you're like, it, it's not just this one component. You can't just dramatically innovate and disrupt one part because that part is connected to every other part. So if you want to do MOOCs, well, you got to go back and say, how are student loans funded in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, can you get a, and because that's going to make a massive difference. You can't innovate and disrupt, to use that word, without this other piece over here. Well, if you do that piece over there, then you also have this other part of a credential or a degree. How can you make that as a possible output? So the reason I think it's been so difficult to see the desired impact is it's an interconnected system of systems and tweaking and innovating one part of it and then blowing the hype out about it is, is just a recipe for failure. But anyway, just a few quick thoughts on that. Um, I'll, give a, I'll give a preview. We did a great interview um, for our Teach Lab podcast that we haven't released yet with Mitchell Stevens. Um, who's a sociologist of education at Stanford. And one of the things that he brought to my attention was that in the CARES Act, and the CARES Act in the United States was the supplemental funding that went to a bunch of different sectors after the pandemic to municipalities and to higher education and things. Um, but actually, um, CARES Act funding was limited in certain ways to target enrollees in four-year degree programs um, that basically, you know, at the kind of like highest federal funding policy levels, there was a sort of guidance during the pandemic that says like, don't change the basics of our credential awarding model, um, or you can't have this funding. Um, so to some extent, there's uh, this notion that like, oh, we, you know, we, we, like, it's a pandemic, we have to do things really differently, as long as it doesn't change in any of these, you know, X kinds of ways that actually seem uh, like, uh, like they're, they're pretty important. Um, uh, Kristen DeCerbo says, uh, you, you know, that it seems like a fairly standard example of the gardner Heif cycle of, you know, the, the, the peak of inflated expectations to the trough of disillusionment to the plateau of productivity. Um, I would only observe that, that in this case, the plateau of productivity just seems to be quite different from what the peak of inflated ex expectations would be. I mean, so much of the rhetoric of early MOOCs was about how we're going to create new kinds of access for new sorts of populations. Um, and some providers have been really specific that like, we, we are here to, you know, we think the most pa profitable pathway forward is to partner with master's degree, partner with universities to create new master's degree programs in topics that we think are, you know, computationable, tractable, um, and, uh, you know, have a good return on investment for learners and therefore for universities. Um, so I don't know. I be, I don't know. I have to do a sort of study of hype cycles to see how often it is the case that that things track in one place, but but not another. Um, Liz, you were involved in a bunch of efforts that were that were creative critiques of the MOOC movement. I mean, or at least I positioned FemTechNet. You can tell me if I'm wrong here. As intended to be a, a, a creative critique of um, of the MOOC movement. You know, what, what, what parts of that critique still seem salient to you? Um, what, you know, what are, what are parts of that critique that, that you think really got heard and got through in higher education or the public more broadly? And then what kinds of things do you think people still need to hear? Um, like George, uh, I think that the opportunity for a distributed network to be activated uh, is one of the exciting things about being able to make online pedagogical connections. So what FemTechNet was interested in the fact that uh, there was a lot of interest in feminist theory in different online communities. And um, despite all of the 
online misogyny and all of the harassment that that takes place uh, around issues of the study of gender and sexuality online, um, that there was also a lot of interest. And so um, a group of feminist science and technology researchers thought it would be uh, led initially by Anne Balsamo and Alexander Juhas, thought that instead of having this idea of the kind of single source of knowledge broadcast the these video lessons that we should instead model how knowledge is co-constructed and how knowledge uh, exists in dialogue. So the, the idea of the initial videos would, would be that they would be dialogic and that they would show two feminist scholars talking to each other and be a kind of invitation for the students to talk back and create videos themselves. And we were influenced by the thinking of Lee Starr around boundary objects. Right? What does it mean to, in, to, to treat learning materials not necessarily as didactic instruction, but instead as opportunities for different communities to do sense-making activities around them? And that, you know, we could kind of like create these videos and other materials that people would then, you know, be free to do what they wanted with. And if they want to teach a, a course about feminist science and technology studies in their local library, as one woman did, with a bunch of, you know, people who were just interested in feminism, you could. Um, and we kind of tried to encourage uh, students to sort of speak back to the group. Now, the problem is like any kind of feminist organizing, it's, there's, there's going to be strife, you know, particularly around uh, issues of intersectionality and the ways that kind of white feminists uh, can use up all the oxygen in a, a, a particular, so that there were, you know, there were prestigious white feminists associated with elite institutions and then uh, people who are more precarious in academic institutions who might also have a more radical politics that they wanted to offer a kind of more radical education model around. So there were constant conflicts, like any kind of feminist organizing, there's got like gotta be a lot of affective labor around. And, you know, it's also hard if you just do regular old co-teaching, you know, that's hard. I always don't understand why universities give half credit to faculty members for doing co-teaching. Because I like to joke, it's like driving a car with two steering wheels, right? Co-teaching is really hard. It's twice as much effort. It's not half as much effort. And so, you know, FemTechNet uh, created some great resources. Uh, and I particularly, I, I think the stuff created by the Center for Solutions to Online Violence that's designed to create toolkits for um, dealing with online harassment. I think those materials are also really useful. Um, so there's a lot of useful stuff there, but I feel like in some ways that was a, a fantastic experiment that, uh, you know, I, I'm not as actively day-to-day -day invested in it because FemTechNet was sort of a second job for me. I was spending about 20 hours a week doing FemTechNet stuff. You know, and, and, and the contrast with, you know, it, I mean, it's interesting here to talk about here, here we're going to put conversation at the center where we're doing and conversation, especially about these topics comes with real challenges, real challenges of, you know, managing these misunderstandings or, you know, or, or different perspectives or all those kinds of things, you know, and I think MOOCs in some ways, you know, even when they're on controversial topics, um, can relegate that to the corner by putting them into, you know, forums, which are in many ways less central to the experience than they were in FemTech did. I, you know, I did a series of, stu of studies, you know, I don't know, 2014, 2015 about uh, um, discussion forums and MOOCs and whether or not mm -hmm. there were going to be conflicts between Republicans and Democrats in courses about introduction to American government um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, introduction to education policy, those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, to, we, we devised this whole research agenda, which was based on using machine learning to, uh, surveying people about their beliefs and using machine learning to, to detect conflict. And then where we found unproductive conflict, figuring, figuring out ways of making the dialogue more productive. Um, except in these courses, we could never find unproductive conflict. Um, you know, like basically people were... <laughs> 
where we were like, I know you don't believe me, but like, you know, I, we published this paper in 2016, right? As the nation was sort of in the midst of tearing it apart. And we said, you know, if you like, if you want to have a civil, I don't, I, I can't imagine, I, I mean, I think this is probably still true to some extent, but it, you know, in 2016, for sure, if you wanted to have a civil conversation with people who didn't believe in what you believed in, grounded in empirical facts, um, the forums of, you know, uh, saving schools and uh, um, introduction to American government on Harvard X were like actually pretty good places to go to, to do that. Um, but I think part of it is that they were, you know, they, they were they were sort of marginal to the core of the enterprise. There was a place that they, you know, go to hang out, but not really, uh, not really go in. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things I was interested in, in the war on learning too, is people using the forums for purposes other than what they were intended for. So particularly people who were, uh, you know, essentially using the forums for things like finding romantic partners who might be interested in the topics that you were interested in. Um, learning, and, learning English is another huge one. Um, yes, that sort of learning English. Bounds all kinds of research that we do is people telling us like, yeah, I'm not really that interested in accounting or, you know, or the, you know, ancient Elizabethan, po uh, Elizabethan poetry. It just, it was the course that was running and it was in English and I wanted to learn something from it. Um, George, one, um, one claim that you've made that I would love to have you interrogate in light of the arguments in the book is something like, it is, you know, I think, I think you've claimed that it is really important for universities to be investing in MOOCs, in online learning, in some sort of future turn towards digitization. Um, you know, part of the argument in the book is that some of the universities that did that um, uh, really didn't get much out of it. Um, you, you know, that there were, that there were a handful of places that found themselves, you know, if, like if you picked the right subject area and you had the right team and you invested enough early on, um, you might have come out ahead or okay, you know, if you're Georgia Tech putting in the first um, online Masters of Computer Science with 7,000 people in it, that you're in good shape. But if you're not the first person to market or you don't get the right sort of product market fit, you know, you get, I mean, I, there are places like the University of Texas system, which invents, invested a million dollars into a new center, um, which closed not too many years later. Um, in your view, sort of how do you, how do you, you know, this, ar this argument that, that universities need to be investing in MOOCs or things like MOOCs, um, even when, you know, it's like, it seems to me that some, like many of those investments don't pay off. Um, and, you know, and, and sometimes they simply end up, even, even when they're successful, they're successful in just sort of a like sustaining kind of way. That, that's a, that's a very long conversation. So I'm going to try and just sort of get to the, to the gist of it, the way that, that I see it. So the argument I've been making for, I don't know, probably 15 years, the main argument has been, if you want to understand the future of knowledge systems, you have to understand the architecture of information. And that is, how are people creating, sharing, disseminating, exchanging information? And Liz touched on this with, with, the, with the MOOC and the work she was talking about, where you have, in a traditional course, you, you have a faculty member who is the brilliant expert. In a feminist MOOC, in contrast, you have multiple voices, each having some degree of awareness about the position that they occupy in the conversation, and in some cases, the limits of what they occupy in that position. So uh, the, that's possible in a digital environment, and it's not necessarily possible in a regular classroom. You cannot have a classroom with 4,000 people each sharing their own opinion. And there are no mechanisms to, to essentially take the best ideas, advance them, amplify them, improve them. And the best idea itself is a subjective statement. So if that's the core argument that the future of universities will be those that mirror what is possible with information, not a new argument. There was a text reinventing knowledge uh, that I've mentioned many times in the past, which makes a similar argument that says right from the start of the Library of Alexandria and even prior, the way that society built knowledge institutions was a byproduct of what they did with information. So for example, the development of Lyceum and the Academy in, in ancient Greek, uh, Greece was a byproduct of this mode of we can communicate audibly and exchange and the rise of rhetoric and those kinds of approaches. Eventually, even the development of classification systems like Dewey and others were a byproduct of the need for, for the growth of information and how we manage it and, and address it. So that's my core uh, view. 
how does that impact universities? Well, we don't know what necessarily has a successful impact in various education settings. It does require you experiment and you play a lot. Uh, are MOOCs the solution? Of course not. And I, I said this right at the start is that MOOCs are not the trend that matter. They're a reflection of a number of factors that are at play. Clearly, the idea of learning at scale resonates with someone or else they would have just died off right up front. Uh, we would have run them and that would have been it. So there must be some degree of resonance with someone. Is that resonance with the corporate providers that are trying to find a way to increase their training and development for their staff with reduced cost? Possibly. Is it for people who are in different parts of the world who might not have access to a lot of the instructional opportunities that MOOCs afford? Perhaps. Could be the same in parts of Canada and the U.S. alone, where there are regions where you're outside of the main area where you can have access to an anthropology prof and you really super duper love anthropology, such as my daughter does. And she finds that you can take it on MOOCs, but she can't take it at her local university and the list goes on. So I do think, call it something else, not MOOCs, but universities need to be playing in the spaces that allow us to do different things with information that shift the power balance of who can say it, who can listen to it, who can influence it, who can adjust it. Now, MOOCs have been a defined entity that allows people to be able to do that in a structured way. It gives it a name and it allows us to say, hey, we're also doing that thing. Now, it'd be very interesting to see post-COVID, my, you mentioned sort of your instinctual assessment of how MOOCs impacted, how were impacted by COVID. I think my assessment instinctually is, and I've seen this unfold from University of Texas Arlington in particular, where we didn't have a well-developed infrastructure for teaching online. Everything had to be built up from scratch, really down to a new department. Recording studios weren't available. Tool sets weren't available. Everybody settled on Teams, not because it's a fantastic tool, but because somebody came by and said, hey, use Microsoft Teams, and now it's our primary instructional tool. No intention, no critical thought. It was all just, we got to get online. We have to do it now. I mean, I'm not blaming UTA for that. They literally had no choice but to try and move things online. So I think the focus of doing something experimental is that there's intentionality, there's a set of structured questions, you're not buying the product that the first person that knocks on your door with a viable resource uh, will be will be used, uh, you, that you'll end up using, I should say. So I, I still maintain, yes, playing in the spaces where interesting things are done with digital information is vital for universities. Today that place is MOOCs, or maybe a few years ago that place was MOOCs. Uh, there's a number of things emerging that it may end up being going forward, but universities absolutely should be perpetually tinkering with how it is that they do the core things that they do. They've massive, and I do blame university leadership here, they've massively missed out on the digital revolution that everybody saw coming for three decades and they failed to prepare their institutions and their faculty for what it means. And as a byproduct, they've had to outsource much of their core capability to external for-profit providers. And when you say um, outsource their core capabilities, you particularly mean partnering with online program managers, partnering with organizations that say, hey, give us some money and we'll do your online instructional design for you. When that online instruct, when, when any kind of instructional design really ought to be the the core, um, uh, you, you know, the core competency of universities that we should, you know, we should outsource uh, our our janitorial services and our accounting, but not how we do teaching and learning. Well, I think it's for me a big part of it is just simply intentionality. Are you in control of the very thing that you contribute most meaningfully to society? And universities are still in control, but they are less in control than they were 20 years ago, because one way to look at it is, you know, you've got this, this uh, entity of higher education that plays a role in society. You have a peripheral system, which we'll call sort of the corporate system that has been for a long period of time, looking at ways that they can enter the university or the could be K to 12 sector and, and generate some uh, efficiency for the system and economic value for themselves. Universities are reasonably self-contained. The digitization process that universities botched uh, provided a massive doorway in. Initially, it was just Microsoft sells you things or Canvas sells you an LMS. But, and then you're kind of like, well, that's okay. That's like hiring an engineer to come in and build uh, or a, an architect and designer to come in and build a classroom. It's the same thing. But now you have these same organizations coming in and actually doing the core thing that you're supposed to be doing. They're doing the tutoring. 
they're doing the grading, they're doing the recruiting, they're developing the curriculum, they're teaching the curriculum. So at the state we're going, without being needlessly negative, is we are creating a disaggregated system, or we are disaggregating a system that is being put together and restitched with corporate interests. And that will give us sort of a Frankensteinian model of higher education. And I've whined about this for years that the people who are most, and there was a period early on where a lot of sort of, I'll use the word progressives, but there was a lot of people who were genuinely fascinated this opportunity for innovation in the education sector, uh, because we could do away with this idea of these traditional blocky bureaucratic universities. And I love universities. I love higher education experience. I love the hope they give to people. And yet, and, and even though I was arguing, you cannot do away with universities. They play a vital countering balance to the other power institutions in society. And now we're seeing that that very system is being disaggregated by individual functional pieces that are core to their long-term existence. And I cannot see, unless there's a sustained and focused pushback, that in their current form, they'll be sustained over the next 20 years, simply because we will have offloaded so much of the core functionality to external providers. It'll still exist as a university, but it will not have the ethos that it has today. That's great. And then, you know, so sort of summarize your cases, Mike, there needs to be innovation in these course places because sometimes we get pushed and forced by external forces to do that. And if we're not prepared ourselves to do it, then there are for-profit entities that are waiting to sort of swoop in. So Liz, we, I mean, we can't end this conversation about innovation without, without talking about new technologies and talking about TikTok. Um, so what should be, what, how, how, does, how does thinking about learning applications of TikTok now sort of, uh, what, what kind of coda can we have of this conversation? How does a, how does a brand new form sort of sweeping the world, um, you know, what does the story of MOOCs tell us about how we should think about the story of TikTok? Well, I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about TikTok is the ways that people are using this, you know, this huge database of audio clips. And so... You know, there's all of this creative remix going on with the the source files that people upload to TikTok. And so somebody uploads a rant to TikTok and then you'll see, you know, 50 other people lip sync something to that rant that will then, you know, be these sort of new spins on it. And I think the thing that's interesting to me about TikTok as a learning space is the element of performance. And so again, because I'm interested in questions of gender and sexuality, it's interesting to see all of this cross-gender, cross-racial play that people are experimenting with. Um, it's also interesting to see how the knowledge of particular, uh, so, you know, cops on TikTok, nurses on TikTok, nuns on TikTok. Firefighters. How different, yeah, I, how, how TikTok is this space where uh, one's professional identity still can ground your ethos of performance. Um, I mean, Jill Walker Retberg did this whole series of Snapchat research stories. I don't know if you've seen any of them, but she, she talked about Musical.ly, which was TikTok before it was TikTok. And she tried to like do lip syncing herself and, and, you know, it's actually really difficult to do. Like I've, um, you know, I mean, making a good TikTok video is actually really hard. Some of these makeup tutorials are amazing in terms of, of you know, I, I, there's one on there that the, the woman who created said it took her, uh, I think, four weeks to do. And I believe it because the, the tutorial is just, I, I mean, the, the makeup is just incredible. So I think that there's, there's this element of live performance, that liveness, uh, in, in addition to the sort of digital composition and remix that seems really important about TikTok as a learning space. Well, we are going to have more opportunities to talk about these sort of peer-driven networks when we, when we read about chapter three, which we certainly will have Natalie Rusk and uh, Mitch Resnick coming in, but, but Liz and George, both of your expertise lend uh, themselves equally well uh, to that chapter, and we'll have some more things that are, that are in there. Um, I 
want to say thank you to all the folks in the chat who are conversing and sharing back and forth. There are a whole bunch of questions that came up there that I thought, oh, those are some pretty good answers that um, that uh, that folks are are sharing. Um, we've spent uh, um, a bunch of time this last couple of weeks talking about higher education. Next week, we're going to talk about intelligent tutors, and we're going to zoom in much more on the K-12 sector. Um, and we've got Neil and Christina Heffernan, who are the developers of a system called the Sysments, um, coming in to talk with us uh, about that period of time. Certainly lots of the themes that we've been talking about here, auto graders, um, there was a question about that we'll spend a whole week talking about um, with the trap of routine assessment um, and uh, some things about learning analytics. We have a chapter about the toxic power of uh, data and experiment. Um, but I definitely think that one piece of the end of this conversation, which captures the theme that I feel strongly about and hopefully came out through the book, um, is that I do feel like something that is particularly Particularly powerful about new technologies is the way that they inspire, they, they invite, they inspire, they compel conversations about what is our pedagogy, what are we trying to do here, um, what is the purpose of our institutions, and I think whether that's thinking about that through the lens of where, what, what are the right spaces for feminist discourse and debate in the university and the public, what is the space for creative expression through TikTok and learning, um, what should we think about the sort of institutional structures of universities and how they outsource or not their pieces. I mean, I think, you know, to me, probably what has kept me interested in education technology, more so than its actual efficacy, um, is its ability to invite these conversations and to have, you know, faculty, students, administrators who are, um, who are pretty, you know, who can be in routines and be set in their ways, be sort of brought back by, wow, look at this new thing that all my students are doing, or look at these new laptops that in 1990 um, are being spread out. Look at this pen discourse system that we could participate in in the early 90s. And they spark a whole new set of conversations and discussions. And that theme came out um, really strongly in this conversation. So thank you. Um, so Liz and George, thanks so much for joining us and helping us think through this at, uh, um, you know, for in your afternoon, on a hiking trip, Liz, and whatever <laughs> horrific time it is for you, uh, George, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks so much thanks for so the so book, much, <laughs> Justin. And great to, great to chat with you, George. I'm a fan. Right. Great. And I, yours. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Great to, great to see all of you who are out in the attendee world. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next week with Neil and Christina Heffernan. Should be fun. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Bye.